Good afternoon, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, it's great to see so many people. Um, I'm not sure it's so great to have followed Michael Barr, however. Um, the, uh, the bar has been raised um, considerably. Let me see. Trying to get us going on uh, our slides. There we go. What we want to start talking about today in a relatively limited space of time is about the racial wealth gap. And what we want to really start doing is talk about why we're concerned about the racial wealth gap and, and what that means. For us, when we first started this work many years ago and as we continue it today and hopefully well into the future, what looking at the racial wealth gap really means to us is the ability, the opportunity, the space to explore what's been happening in American society nearly 45 years or so after the passage of major civil rights legislation around housing, around lending, around education, around all kinds of critically important opportunities in American society. And it allows us to shift the lens, to shift the lens in a way um, as Martin Luther King was talking about in his later years, to shift the lens to economic justice, to beginning to have an understanding of what the relationship is, if anything, between the changing of laws and the relationship of economic power and what that looks like over time. The way we do that, one of the central benchmarks we use is through by looking at the racial wealth gap. We understand from the beginning that the problems that present themselves to make up the racial wealth gap did not begin yesterday and they will not be solved tomorrow. But every day we delay, the cost of justice grows higher. We acknowledge a terrible history. We acknowledge that discrimination by the Federal Housing Administration, for example, that runs a straight line through insurance and some financial institutions in the past to redlining. And I would suggest that line continues and has continued to the current day into our understanding of the subprime lending crisis. All of that in housing markets alone deprive African Americans of millions, billions of dollars. Rarely, however, do we sit back and ask other critical questions that should proceed from those facts. Questions like, who took the money? How did they take it? Where did it go? Where is it now and how is it being utilized? Home mortgage interest deduction, for example, and the favored, very favored tax status of inheritances and capital gains all work to augment the value of unfair gains secured through past and direct discrimination in previous eras as well as through discrimination in the era that we are currently living in. We want, we need to connect the unjust impediments of wealth accumulation imposed on African Americans to the realization of unfair and unjust enrichment by others as two sides of the same coin. So let's go back to some baseline. The baseline is what the racial wealth gap looks like. And the, the slide that's in front of you um, is a recent illustration. It's taken from a particular data set. The important point to understand is that whatever data set the researchers like us look at, whatever definition of wealth one uses, the same stylized pattern of fact emerges. Whatever the number is, the pattern is that the, af the average median half above and half below African American family owns a dime in wealth to every dollar of wealth that the average or median white family owns. That's not changed. That's not changed since data like this first became available to us um, in the middle part of the 1980s. We've had the opportunity 
Um, not simply to look at data like I just gave you, which is cross-sectional, that is, it's data, people are asked a question at one point in time, and we don't have the ability to follow them to see what's happened to those families. I want to present uh, two pieces of what I think are really important data around a study that we were able to do that followed the same set of families uh, in the panel study of income dynamics between 1984 and the year 2007 following the same set of families as they go through their life course, as they age, as they marry, as they have children, as they retire, as they march through American institutions, as they march through communities. And that gives us, I think, the very trenchant ability to see what happens to the racial wealth gap over time in the so-called normal course of events. And I want to highlight um, two facts, and I'm going to augment both of those with, with uh, some charts for you. The first one is that the racial wealth gap increased fourfold. It went up four times between 1984 and 2007, 2007 before, if you will, data around the Great Recession came in. And second, what we will see is that the huge bulk of the wealth accumulation in this era, in this generation of 23 years, primarily goes to the uh, relatively well-off to begin with. So the first chart. The first chart shows um, very simply two lines. The blue line is uh, the average or median wealth of white families walking through time from 1984 to 2007 and the red line at the bottom is the same for African-American families. 1984, the racial wealth gap is $20,000. In constant dollars, by the year 2007, following the same set of families again, that racial wealth gap has grown to $95,000. Right. When we talk about the racial wealth gap and the relationship, economic relationship that it stands for, we are not talking just about a legacy of race in our past, but clearly, we're talking about that, and we're talking about uh, the impact of contemporary institutions. The second chart, uh, and we may want to stop here for a moment or two for you to be, um, as I, I like to say that I'm a jaded researcher, uh, this one dropped me in my tracks, quite frankly. The blue line at the very top is the line for in, what, in 1984, were high-earning white families. By high earning, we simply meant the top third of the income distribution in this sample in 1984. And their median wealth starts off at $68,000, and again, in constant dollars. We all would like to be on this line. I would like everybody to be on this line in this trajectory. It marches up to about $234,000. Um, and everything potentially that goes with that, the well-being for themselves and their children and their community that goes with that. Um, the, Orangest line represents high-earning African-American families in 1984. And we look at their wealth, it starts off at about $25,000, again in constant dollars. Over the next 23 years to 2007, that high-earning African-American group, their wealth actually declines. And it goes down to about $18,000. The blue line shows, I think very clearly, where by far the huge bulk of the wealth accumulation that the society created in that 23-year period went. And the last thing I would draw your attention to is look at how the lines cross for middle-income earning whites in 1984. Their wealth line starts below, as it in theory should, starts below high-earning African Americans, but it crosses in about five years. So that by 2007, a gap has opened up, if you will, between, in 1984, what were middle-income-earning whites and high-earning African-Americans. A disruption, a disjunction, a lack of ability for the labor market to return to families the kinds of resources that result in how they can plan for their own mobility, the way they use financial assets in that instance. This highlights, as I think we will later too, this I think particularly underlines the damage that African Americans and other vulnerable communities have suffered through in terms of labor market activity in the last, not just through the Great Recession, but prior to that. So, if we're talking about 
in the sample we were looking at, a $95,000 question. What is that gap made of? How do we get to a $95,000 difference between families over their life course, the same set of families? We can suggest, we all could suggest answers to it, and we all would be right, frankly, because there are a lot of components to a $95,000 difference. What I think it's really key and critically key to do is to start framing strategic answers through research and policy analysis that talk about the main drivers of that $95,000 wealth gap. What we want to do in the rest of, the, of our time here today is to lay out the beginning of a policy blueprint on how to address the racial wealth gap. And we're going to do it um, through four parts for today. Um, first, I'm going to talk about the wealth building provisions of the U.S. tax code. Surprise, surprise. Second, um, we're going to talk a little bit about the estate tax. Um, third, uh, Melvin is going to uh, take over the podium at that point for the rest of the presentation. He will talk about housing, segregation, and the, wealth Im the disparate wealth impact. And the fourth policy area is going to be children's savings account. First, um, as the information is now public, thank you CFED, the most recent figures indicate that the individual wealth building provisions in the U.S. federal tax code amount to about $400 billion a year. Not a one-off, but every single year repeated. Primarily, it's home interest mortgage deduction, it's savings for retirement and pension, and th those are the two largest, largest buckets of that. Right. If we now were to ask, of that $400 billion, what percentage of that, an estimate, goes to African Americans? through partaking in home mortgage interest deduction, through partaking in savings and retirement pensions, and the other parts, the other components in there. Our estimation is, and frankly we'd like to have much better data, um, our estimation is that uh, approximately 13.4 billion of that $400 billion wealth building budget uh, benefits African American families. African American families are about 13.5% of the population. If, hypothetically, there were some um, more equitable, demo democratic distribution of those benefits, the African American share would amount to about $48.5 billion. What's left on the table, therefore, is I think the huge, perhaps the biggest policy stake around. $35 billion annually I think becomes the challenge of how do we think about redesigning, reconstituting wealth building provisions in the tax code so that uh, they benefit low and moderate income families, communities of color, and vulnerable communities in a way that is much more equitable. And then I want to close off my participation by talking a little bit about, about the estate tax. Um, I didn't bring any data because I, don't, I think actually I don't want data to drive this. Um, I want us to think like, like Americans. I want us to think about the values of the country. Um, to me it's real simple. The simplicity is that inheritance is the enemy of meritocracy. Inheritance is the potential enemy of equal opportunity. Very simply, you cannot have, you cannot square that circle. We cannot pass along huge advantages to children, to adult children, to other members of one's family, and at the same time, highly, or claim that we highly value meritocracy and equal opportunity. Um, thank you. Melvin is going to come up and talk about um, housing segregation and the disparate wealth impact.